My name is Natazi Weathers. I am the film curator at LACMA, amongst other things. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. This was a great program. I guess my first question is just, uh, how, how are you feeling? And what, <laughs> what, also, what are you curious about at this point of the, of the night and the screen? <laughs> Um, I, I'm actually surprisingly well. I had a glass of wine, and uh, I'm holding up. I feel decently. Um, you're curious about it, but you know, you mean uh, the screening? What do you mean? Can you elaborate? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I was at your screening on Thursday. Oh, right. And I really appreciated kind of the conversation that you were having with the audience and the films and your curiosities around, you know, what folks were feeling or how they were interacting with the films. So also as a way to prime our audience for potential questions later on, I'm wondering maybe if you have some thoughts or, or questions maybe that you have for the oh, audience okay. that they could think audience. about. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, wow. That's a new one. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Hmm. <laughs> Let me get back to you, okay? Uh, I, I think it will come, you know, during the course of the conversation. Um, I, I will say that, you know, it's uh, quite an experience to watch a new film with an audience hours after you finish it. Like I said, I haven't lived with the film, so I don't really know how I feel about it exactly. I know I wanted to make it. It's something I wanted to make and tried to make. Uh, but beyond that, I can't really say because I, uh, much of my work typically reveals itself to me over time, living with it and responding to the audiences and discussions and seeing what other people have to say and sometimes write about it. Um, I will say that I'm really um, kind of a, uh, a place where I, I'm really trying to stretch out of my comfort zone. And, you know, um, well, I, I do have a question now. Hey, yes, okay, here it, it occurs to me because it has something to do with this. It's like, um, I don't know how to put it in the form of a question, but it, it is something that I think about surprisingly to me, at least on a regular basis. And that's really like methods of getting out of my own habits and head. You know, I, I know there are certain things that I like and certain things I like to do. And, um, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's a real conundrum for me as a maker to be, to know the things that I'm interested in and the kinds of uh, approaches that I'm excited about. But at the same time, there's, you know, there's a kind of a comfort level that I really want to avoid. And I, I guess I wonder if, if and how um, others uh, face that question, if they, if you have methods for it. I mean, because it's, it's like you can't not be yourself, but then at the same time, like, what is a self, right? Like, I mean, you're, we're all way more mysterious and complicated than we can ever know. And so I'm wondering, like, in terms of me as a maker, for example, my habits, my inclinations, and my fascinations and obsessions, I'm wondering if, you know, you all have just seen the program of my work, so you might be able to judge, like, what some of the continuities are uh, within the body of work, despite some formal or technical uh, variation. And so, um, you know, what, what is a, you know, I think that's a question for an artist and a person. Like, what does a person do with that? What does an artist do with that? I mean, you know, supposedly artists don't want to become ossified Virgin versions of themselves. And theoretically, neither would a person want to do that, right? But then, you know, there's also the question of continuity and, and, and some kind of identity that is 
um, secure and, and, and strong. So I don't know, I, you know, I, I don't know what to, that, that, that's what I'm thinking about right now. And, and, and I think about this from time to time and you're, you know, this, the context of this program and your question is prompted that. I'm interested in Um yeah, that kind of leads me into a question that I did have for you. And this came up for me when I was watching Descending Descending Figures, yeah. Which also, I think, by chance or something, played twice in a row, I think. Um, which was an interesting thing, because at yeah, the other screen, we also watched some of your work right. twice. Was that, was that on purpose, or was that OK? No, I imagine uh, they probably, I had a file and a folder I gave them without realizing it's one in which I think what I would guess happened is it, is, it plays twice, but the screens are reversed the second time. Oh. And so I have it that way so that people can watch it with the reverse screens if they want. But I didn't realize that that was the file. That <laughs> but I'm actually glad because I actually prefer that if people can see it two ways, right? Because that's why I shot it, the diptych, so that it could be seen in either way. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that one, that one for me brought up kind of some of the things that you were talking about uh, in terms of not staying stagnant and trying to, uh, you know, switch things up or just be able to kind of stay on your toes. I guess watching that film especially made me, it gave me this physical experience, this, uh, sensory experience that kind of made me think of, I guess, in the in the like workout world and exercise gym culture, they they call it um, muscle confusion, hmm. where they try to switch up your exercises all the time so your muscles stay confused. Yeah. And I feel like with a lot of your films, I get that with my other senses, you know, with my with my eyesight, my vision, the hearing, it always feels like it keeps me very much on edge or just kind of opens up new ways to work my mind, my heart, you know, all the spirit, just, and I feel like your films do that a lot. Um, and especially that one with just the, kind of the flares coming in and out. Um, and, you know, that leads to surprising experiences, feelings, memories, thoughts, it just kind of brings up different things. So, um, and I feel like that is kind of a through line through a lot of your work. The mode in which you work, the way you fashion together the films is very different each time, it feels like. And it also gives us a different effect each time. So could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I was just talking about this the other day. I really admire artists and, and filmmakers who uh, can bring really meaningful um, uh, variations out of um, a way of working. Um, when, when you can make a substantial body of work with uh, a, 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 a very consistent approach across works that don't fall into, you know, minute variations on things and become indistinguishable. I'm not one of those people. I can't really um, do that. And, I, and I'm highly aware of my limitations, and I really try to lean into them and make them the thing that's good about my work. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I see, and I, I you know, technically that I see in other people's work, and I admire it from afar. And I, those, are, those aren't really things that I probably uh, will ever be able to do. And so I, I do other things. Um, I forget, I forget the, the substance of the question. I saw you talking and then I <laughs> Yeah, just that, that style that you work in, that, that effect that you're trying to bring about too. I'm curious what you want the viewer to get when you, when they have those, you know, different styles that you're putting. Yeah, I, okay, I talk about that sometimes as well. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things I always told my students is, you know, I tried to tell them, and I, that somebody truly believes that um, you know, when you, when you, I mean, I'm talking about films, but it could be any kind of work of art, but when you approach, um, a work of art, it's not like, uh, you know, I mean, to me, it's not like you have like that, that you're, um, this, you know, predetermined uh, subject who will 
go and encounter a work of art. Really, like to me, if a work of art is really doing something, it's really creating um, a kind of um, subjectivity for you to inhabit. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna deal with it, like you have to be willing to like enter into it on its own, on its terms, and kind of let go of some of your habitual perceptual modes. You know, you, that's the struggle, is that to really like go with it to a certain degree, or navigate it, or explore it. Um, and, um, you know, so, you know, it's, it, to me, it's not like, you know, you simply watch a film, but that the film creates a version of you that inhabits the film. And, and if, if you can manage that version of yourself to inhabit the film, then uh, you have some kind of meaningful experience. And if you can't, then that's when you reject it. Like, that's, and I, you know, I, I had that experience, unfortunately, too, too often. And I think, you know, and it's, it's an open question whether it's a failing of the filmmaker or myself. You know, I, I'm willing to concede that I'm not always up to the task as a, as a viewer, uh, for whatever reason. And, and, you know, there have been times where all of a sudden a, a light goes on. And it's like, I'm like, wow, you know, this is incredible. And I never really cared much about it. And I don't, I can't explain why that happens. Mm. Um, it, you know, it's contextual or what have you. You know, I went to see a film that I had seen many times before. Uh, but this time I saw it with my daughter, and it was her first time seeing that film, and the film blew me away, and I never cared for it before. So maybe, and, and when I'm teaching, uh, when I show a film to a class, it's a really, really different experience than when I watch it alone, or even if I go to cinema and see it with a paying audience, because I'm really keyed into the things that I want to talk about, uh, with the students regarding the film, and it makes me see the film in a whole different way. So, I mean, that, so in other words, it's not like there's a, you know, like I, that I have a, a, you know, way of encountering a work and the work is just what it is. <laughs> it, I, you know, it, it's just, it, it, I, th I think it's like, I, that's why I get back to the point, like we're, you know, we're, we're all really much more mysterious. Uh, to ourselves, and we would ever really dwell in for the most part. Uh, so I don't know. I sort of got off and rambled a little bit, but that, that those are the things I think about in response to that question. Yeah, I love that. That makes sense. Um, that also makes me think about you know everything that you're describing and kind of encountering films that do that to you too. Yeah. Um, I guess it makes me think of this last film that we saw, which included parts of one of my favorite films, Lake Place, yeah. with Monica Vitti. I love the film too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a very you know intense part of the film. Um, but that's also a film that you know throughout. I feel like it's it kind of evades a lot of logic, and it kind of takes repeated viewings to kind of sink into this feeling about it that doesn't. I don't know, you don't really, at least for me when I watch it, it's hard to put words to some of the feelings and especially the ending. And I feel like, I mean, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I feel like that film also opens up a lot, especially in the, in the world of experimental film and experimental narratives, the way that film ends, I think, as well. Um, but yeah, I'm curious about that, that the use of that film in, in your film, and it was really exciting to see that remixed and kind of put it to a different context, because I don't see a lot of people do that, but um, I mean, obviously that scene, but I'm curious why you incorporated that one into it. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it, it, it's a longer conversation than we really have time, so I'll give you a it's kind of short okay. Uh, okay. response. To the, I guess uh, one thing is that I have noticed that I really like having movie stars in my films. Mm. Uh, Angela Bassett appears in Still Here, and, and Pam Greer, her voice is in Still Here. And then, of course, in uh, Reckless Eyeballing, Pam Greer returns uh, in a feature role. Um, 
And so uh, that's one thing. I, I don't know if I like, you know, having stars in my films. And, um, and one way to do that is just to appropriate the footage and, and rework with that, uh, those personas. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I try not to get off on too much of a tangent, but like one of the things that really interested me about that film, uh, those scenes, the scenes where um, they're talking about uh, basically colonial, colonial Africa, is not the scene itself, and it, it's, I don't reference this about the film in um, speaking in tongues, it's not really that scene itself so much as like a later scene when um, she goes up in an airplane and they arrive at a landing strip and she gets out and she walks up to the bar and there's these two presumably African immigrants sitting in front of the bar. And um, it's just really interesting, like the whole racist caricature was about like, uh, traditional tribal Africa, and here you have these two, you know, modern global citizens of the world that sit and they don't speak a word, they don't even, they don't even acknowledge her, and she somewhat observes them and, and goes on, but you, you get the sense that she's noted them, and the film has therefore through her noted them, and it's it really, so. but uh, you know, like you said, it took a time or two watching the film before I was less interested in the earlier scene and more interested in that moment. Uh, I'm also just as, um, not so much of having to do with um, speaking in tongues, but I'm also uh, just interested in the way European art cinema treats blackness. And I don't know how many people have written extensively about that. I imagine there's scholarship about that. But like, for instance, if you, you know, when I see a film like Weekend and, you know, there's this uh, black character who's, who's this um, garbage collector, Marxist, I guess. And that's his only, you know, scene in the film. And it just makes me think about how, you know, in these films, the, you know, Europeans are having existential crisis but, you know, um, the black characters, so far as they appear, don't, they don't have, actually, they have maybe, you know, political uh, uh, crisis, but they, but they, they know, you know, like, Corolla Fu is, like, barely able to hold himself together. He, you know, he's talking about, like, his, his ears and eyes don't connect, and, you know, and, but, like, you know, like, you, you know, you, that's why, like, and now I'm really going to ramble, get off on a tangent, but that's, that's why, you know, I particularly love a film like um, Wendell Harris's Chameleon Street, because, like, when I saw that film, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's all right. Like, there are neurotic black people in the world <laughs> who are going crazy and shit all the time, and, you know, it's not, like, that's not, you know, they, too, can have, like, these crises of that, 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 you know, the European arts and, and still be black people. Like, it's not like some other stuff, right? So, I mean, it's just like, it's just a limiting kind of, um, uh, 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 I, don't, I don't know how to say it, but it's just a very, very kind of limiting kind of tropes that you get, it depending on what, what kind of cinema it is. And, and European art cinema has a, its own set of limiting kind of tropes. Um, I had it in my head a more direct answer to your question about her. Oh, so one thing that I really like about Monica Vitti's performance in that film is like, um, I like the sense of existential dread that she's able to convey in her performance. Yeah. And so I bar I wanted to borrow that for this film, right? And so and globalize this concern with like can't really even though I said and it's true that I've been thinking about this film for a very, very long time, I, I will confess that a lot of what I wanted to put into the film did not make it into take one. So there may be 
other tapes forthcoming, I would say. So, uh, and a lot of it could be expounded upon in further takes and where I might drill down and go really elaborate. But I will say that the main attraction to Monica Vitti was her existential dread and repurposing that for a, a different set of, um, uh, a, a different set of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, got, I feel like I got a lot of joy or just like some sort of satisfaction that I didn't realize that I wanted just even seeing those scenes in the context of your film, having her actually interact with black folks, like, you know, from, from scene to scene. Um, yeah, personally, that was very nice for me. But I guess that brings up also like, yeah, I'm so, I'm so curious and really um, just excited by your process of like sampling like what you're talking about in terms of you know appropriating scenes or like actors from other films yeah. um and that process and you talked about it the other day too that that's just so exciting to me and the way that you do that um i guess it makes me think of you know just echoes of the past being able to sample and cover events of the past even covering reality as musicians cover each other's work, you know, um, and then having people perform this kind of new reality, this new political reality that you're creating in your films. And that's really exciting to me. Um, so I'm curious about your process of sampling. What, what is your process? What's your method? I know you, what I've read too is that you are very driven by music and you've talked about that by, you know, black music and of course, and that, that tradition is, you know, building on the past of those that have come before and building on that artistry and continuing to build on that. And I see that a lot in what you do. So I'm curious, like, yeah, what is, what is your, what is your crate digging look like? Um, you know, what is, are there any musicians or kind of black sampling techniques that you think of in the music world that, that drive your process as well? Uh, Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'm so explicitly um, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. At, I, I have to. I don't know. I told you. I, I, I'm, I yeah. haven't slept since Friday night. Yeah, take uh, time. Yeah, and I edited it for 29 hours in a row, <laughs> not sleeping and only taking breaks to eat, but. Other than that, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> so I can't, it's a very simple word I actually just can't think of right now. But the point being, um, I, don't, I don't know that I'm explicitly, that was the word, inspired. Uh, I don't know that I'm explicitly inspired by um, the sampling practices in my own practice, uh, except to say that, you know, I think I'm more, it's more, and what I think, I, I will say that I think what I share with uh, people who crate dig, and what my crate digging process probably has in um, common with them is a certain kind of obsessiveness. Like, you know, um, I really, I, I, I had borrowed a print of Leclerc to optically print for this film, and I had it for a really long time because I wasn't able to print for a really long time for mechanical problems, et cetera, et cetera. And after like years, the person, the, the institution that loaned it to me was like, you know, um, can we have that brand back now, please? <laughs> and I, of course, so I held on to it for, I don't know, I lost track of years, right? And so I immediately, you know, packed it up and shipped it back without using it yet. But lo and behold, I found it on eBay and immediately jumped on it and did probably an obscene amount of money, but fortunately it was some innocent institution's money, not on my own okay. personal income. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, oh, yeah, so that's one of it, like, I can just go on. So I flew to Toronto in order to optically print a few minutes of Jimi Hendrix at Monterey. Mm. Like that, that I'm telling you my obsessiveness here, yeah. right? That, like it, I, I literally, I went up there, optically printed, hand processed, spent the night, I've done a lot of all-nighters for this film. 
<laughs> uh, spent the night in the lab, um, my last day there, doing exposure tests, and finally got it right. Finally got the few feet of film that I needed, and left the lab uh, at, you know, it was like probably 7 a.m., went back to the place where I was standing and went straight to the airport. <laughs> so. Uh, those are the kind of things that, so there's a, like, I think it's about obsessiveness, like really feeling that you have to have that particular piece of film for this, this film, or it's, you know, it's, it's like all or nothing, you know, and that, that, that's sort of been my attitude about the film, it's like, not giving, and that's my, that's sort of my process with uh, sampling and appropriation too, because I'll just, I'll just, I'll hunt it down. I'll hunt it down, and I'll, I'll outlast the the the, the, the vicissitudes of, of misfortune that, that evade where the print evades me. But I keep I, I keep going. I have a few on my radar now that I'm still going after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful to see, and I feel like that. I mean, obviously, that passion comes out in the films and knowing what parts to use, the love that you have for those films, like it's very clear in how you use them and how you appropriate them into your own work. Um, I guess also to maybe give you a little bit of a break, I want to see if there's any folks in the audience that have a question they would like to ask or maybe could start thinking about that. Okay. And start, start thinking of some questions that you might have. Um, oh, it's there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right over here. I was curious if you feel like there's a, a spirit of like, or like an interest in like ever broadcasting, how to sort of like hijacking of like certain, uh, certain like uh, channels of broadcasting. Like, I think that speaking in tongues, if there's that long section of the like, sort of Sanctioned or the allowed narrative that's being told, and then you come to print it. Right. And then I feel like in some kind of state, also, there's almost that almost reminding of the Max Headroom sort of, <laughs> of the audio, almost like that Max Headroom uh, <laughs> So I was curious if there was something uh, that you found like a kindred spirit in that, uh, in that practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I don't, you know, I feel like, uh, I mean, it's not like I consciously set out to do it. I mean, it's just a basically a way of uh, being in the world. I mean, I don't have much choice because I don't have, like, you know, I don't own the means of production. So I, I have to, like, scavenge and, you know, sort of uh, riff on the, the official culture's um, narratives in that way. Like that, that's, that's, that's probably the only, because I mean, I wouldn't have another kind of platform. Yes, I'm a university professor, but come on. <laughs> yeah, look, at, look at the world today. University professors are like the least powerful in battle people. Like, like you know, politically, Universities are shot right now. I shouldn't be saying this, no. but I mean it's clear. I mean it's not like I'm breaking any news here, like, yeah. you know. So like even uh, you know, and, and and you know like anyway, I, I'm about to say something silly, but I won't. But uh, yeah, so that that that's sort of like that's how I have to move because I don't have my hands on the levers of power. So that's that's the way to move. Well, I have a, another little thread that I was really interested in watching, especially all these films in this program. Um, you know, in the in the first film, we have them talking about the idealized radiating object. Yeah. Um, for that, and I guess I think also the other films in this program, and what's been on my mind lately is just thinking of the stars, thinking of the sun, thinking of black holes, just all the all the things that make up our universe. Um, idealized radiating object was making me think of you know the the bright whiteness of the sun, 
and then also the you know the black all absorbing gravity of a black hole um so i guess i'm i'm really curious for you and this for myself as a filmmaker like i've been thinking about how to you know film celestial objects so i'm curious what you think of stars like what is your what what goes on in your mind and your creative soul when you're thinking of stars and we see that in multiple films you know we see it in the film with the the little floating stars kind of shining right, and right. all of that we see it in the in the florida film the sun which is a star yeah, you know sure. turned into kind of this bright blob um but yeah what do you think of stars what do they represent to you what do they movie feel like stars, yeah, yeah movie, movie stars, stars yeah true that's true <laughs> i guess i'm into stuff yeah, you are into the star. Um, and yeah, I guess what, what ways do you think of, I guess, black folks, blackness, and considering and reflecting on stars as well? Wow, you come at that. Go ahead. Is okay. there more? And there is one more. <laughs> I was also curious for you, like, if you have actually tried to film, like, stars, like a starry night, or, like, thought about that, or if that's, if that's in the future for you, too. But any, any of those you want to touch on? Uh, huh. so no, I, I'll start with the last part. I actually haven't, uh, I have not tried to do that. And there are some beautiful films that I admire very much that have done that. There's a film by Jenny Neota called Observando in Seattle. That's just gorgeous. Have you seen that film? Yeah. It's wonderful. And, and it, that, that's a film that I really love quite a bit, but I, that's not something I don't know. I guess that's interesting because uh, both of the films, though, that you mentioned about stars are really earthbound. Mm. You know, uh, so they're about the stars, but my way of contemplating them is to right. be like the small scale, like yeah. it's a night light, right. or it's like, you know, my backyard. You right. know what I'm saying? So, uh, but that's my method is to like, because I, you know, I can't really fathom, you know, um, the amount, like, like just the scale, you know, in, in cosmic time, stars are like sparklers, like they just flare and burn out in cosmic time. But like in human scale, it's like that just really, that's something you can't wrap your mind about, like how just ephemeral we are, we are, you know, it's just like we're like that because the star is like that, right? And But we're like that in relation to the star, so I don't really... I mean, and that's kind of what Sunshine State is like talking about that scale, but by looking down as much as up, maybe even more so down than up, even though it does look up. Um, so, yeah, I've always been, my thing has always been to try to like, and even like I said, the limitations in my films for the most part, like I don't, um, in, in one way or another, um, I'll, I, would, I think it's safe to say that all of my work is about stripping away and uh, working within a kind of um, attenuated um, mode um, where, you know, um, I mean, may, and, I, and, I, and that's one of the things I might be trying to get away with a little bit, away from a little bit with uh, speaking in tongues and maybe some future work. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, my thing has always been, like, I, I don't, I'm, I'm always really super impressed when I see work by an artist in any medium where and that person, like, uh, you know, had, displays virtuosity, because like that, that, you know, not only do you have to be incredibly, um, skilled and gifted, you, you know, you, you, most people like that, they, I, my, my sense is that they decide at some point, consciously or not, that they're going to dedicate their lives to being great at something like that. Like that's, they, they, they don't do, they're not normal people. They don't do other normal things that you and I might do. Like, John Coltrane, I talk about him a lot. I think about him a lot. But John Coltrane 
just practice the saxophone all the time. Like, that's not normal. <laughs> you know? So you, you took that kind of, like, virtuosity and greatness. You know, I don't, you know, like, I tell the story. I tried to teach myself how to play guitar one time when I was a kid. And I, after a few hours, I had blisters on my fingers. And I, that's why I'm not a musician today. <laughs> So, you know, like, I try to work within myself, within my means. I just stay within myself and do that. Like, I have a very small baby wig over here, and I, like, try to really uh, do a lot within that. And so that, that's how I've learned to, to navigate mm. uh, my practice. Yeah. Mm. Also navigating by the stars, too. Yeah. All the different types of stars. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> right. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to check back in for more questions while I put on my glasses. All right, we've got a question right here. Yes. Uh, thanks for this program. Uh, I have a couple questions about image sound juxtaposition. Yes. Uh, I just think it's really interesting the way you do irony and the way you, you set things up. But in particular, and I loved how when we saw like, if you could get the siren, right? That's yeah. like our which is really interesting. Um, but distant chores and the, the, the one about the story of person, I thought was really focused. And I'm wondering, did you start with the sound and decide how do I ironically kind of subvert the sound to create, you know, this montage that goes beyond either the sound or the right. image? And in particular, the one about the story of person, it's almost like because you have the white guy who's asking the questions, right? Mm -hmm. And at the very end of the film, your actress looks at the screen of the African dancers, and then it's like she looks at us and has this really strange, complicit expression as if she... I don't know, I'd like you to talk about it. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the, those two films are really different in terms of my approach because the Zora Neale Hurston film the audio precedes the making of the film. I mean, it's archival audio that I found one day. I was commissioned to make a work about Zora Neale Hurston for an exhibit. And at the time, I was living and teaching in Florida, a few miles from Eatonville, where she grew up. Uh, and she, where she, that she wrote about. And she actually did some of her research there, anthropological research there. She wrote extensively based on Eatonville. Um, and so that has to do because like I had the audio and then I decided I was going to build a film around some existing audio that I didn't create or all or anything like that. Um, but um, what was the second film you asked me about? Uh, Distant Shores. Distant Shores is a different thing altogether because that's some uh, film I was on um, sabbatical in Chicago and um, I decided to just, I wanted to shoot an in-camera film with 100 feet of film on um, a daylight spool with Bolex and tried to just make a film. So I went out on a boat and just started. I didn't have any particular thing in mind. And that, you know, I, 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 well, I projected it back when I got in process. I said, oh, this is not a film. And I just put it on the shelf. And then a few, like about two years later, I met a graduate student who was a Syrian refugee, and they clicked. I was like, oh, that's the film. I, I need her to, you know, I, I, I actually wrote the text and she performed it, because the, te the text was just literally lifted straight out of the New York Times. Like, all the things that she was saying came out of one New York Times article. Um, and then, but I realized, you know, I had this footage of a boat. So they, they're, they're different in that way, and that one was, I'm going to build a film around a pre-existing audio. And the other was, I have this film, but it's not a film, I have footage. <laughs> you know, to me, I say, you know, a film, uh, not all footage is just a film. Uh, and I, you know, right the, at that point, it was footage, but then it became a film much later by, because the sound made it into a film. So in that case, it's really that the sound is actually acting on the image and creating it in a way, transforming it in, in, a, in a very different way. And so I do, and, and I, I really appreciate you saying that because I do think there's somehow some kind of magic between an image and sound that is, you know, 
greater than the sum of its parts. I mean, if, if you really are uh, open and keyed into working that way. Um, yeah. So, and I, it's kind of mysterious to me. I just know it, you know. I mean, literally, I put that siren over Monica Vitti, and I was like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> And you just, no, it's not a, you know, it's not like an intellectual problem. You, it's either right or it's wrong, and it's frustrating. I mean, if you, you know, as, as a maker, you know, you know, like you, you try this, no, you just, and it's not like oh, it, no, because no, no, because it, it's not hitting, it's not hitting, and 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 you know, you just no, 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 yes, and that's the way it works. And I don't really, it's totally, but that's kind of why I love it because. It's not really like I get up and I have a diagram and I pre-plan a film and I'm gonna make this film and here's the logic behind the film. Yeah, I have some thoughts and I have an idea and I have a structure, but then that's just to get me going. And then the rest is like, oh, I just, you have to open, you have to open yourself up to really try to do something. And then you just have to be, you have to be ready to recognize what's in front of you rather than make something is that for me that's my process I, I can't decide oh i'm gonna make no i have to be ready to recognize what's in front of me um and so that's the way i think about sound image relationships because they when they're right they are more than the sound and the image separately can ever be to me so yeah all right i'm gonna do one one last check i want to to call out a couple of people. Pam, you got a question? Or Sebla? Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? You do? Okay. Could you speak to that? I mean, I know that's a big part of yeah. what your are, the repetition in terms of getting a message across or what, how, how that process works for you. That, that's a hard one because I don't, I think it's, I, I don't know, I will say the best I could probably say is that I, I believe that it's, um, an intuitive process to be to, to work through repetition in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that comes out of my love of music because, like, so much of music, black music in particular, is about repetition. And you know, I think I, I think that that's what's undergirding that. Um, um, I mean, that, that's my guess, but, but you know, have you ever read um, James Sneed's Repetition as a Figure of Black Culture? I mean, it's one of my favorite things I've ever read. Um, and, and it's, uh, I mean, I'd like to explain the article to you, but I, I really hope you, I really strongly urge you to read that. And it's not that I read that article and decided to work in repetition, but it says some incredibly illuminating things about Repetition as a like cosmological way of being in the world as a kind of world view. Like, you know, but yeah, I, I, can't, I can't go. I mean, I'll be, it'll take me five minutes of just talking about the article, and I don't know that everybody wants to. It's called Repetition as a Figure in Black Culture by James Sneed. Yeah, he, he talks about, he talks about James Brown's music in there. And I think he mentions John Coltrane and jazz too, uh, but he's, he's really he's really dealing with Hegel in that article. And you know, I, Hegel. I tried uh, Ray. I, I tried to read your book. It's it's like I was like, damn! I just want to take a class with her. I just seriously, and I'm not even kidding. I'm like, I, I'm glad I get to say this publicly, where the way I'm shielded, because I would be too sheepish to go up to you privately and be like. I don't want to take a class with you, but like reading it, but I'm still reading it, but I know I'm not getting like 99% of what you're actually saying in the book. She, she, she has a book about Hegel and other things, but 
But but Sneed's article is like for a non philosopher lay person, it's like so good for me. And it, it really opened up uh thinking about repetition. Hmm. All right. So um, I saw there was another question, but I, I am going to wrap it up. Hopefully you could maybe talk to him in the in the lobby a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask one last question to finish it because I acknowledge it is a Sunday night. It's getting late. You've been up for way too long. Um, so my last question, we we're talking about music. We're talking about repetition. And with this newest film, which is beautiful, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the musical inspiration that, that drove you to make this film. You talked a lot about, and I think in other places, talking about certain music that you listen to that's kind of helped you form ideas for films or helped you in making the films. So if maybe you could talk about some of the music that inspired it or maybe some of the artists. Uh, <laughs> uh, how much to disclose? Um, <laughs> I, I feel very sheepish now because uh, I think you know, I don't, again, I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, I enjoyed watching it. Uh, I think, I definitely think there's a, something happening. You know, I think it was worth making. I think there's something happening there, but exactly what and how much and how I feel about it, you know, within the body of work, I, it's so fresh to say. But the reason I, I'm sort of talking around things is because um, I think it stands on its own as a film, but in terms of like, the inspirations for it. Uh, uh, okay, I mean, if you ask me, I'll be candid. I don't. Uh, I it did. I, I didn't really quite uh, hit my mark. But I can tell you what inspired me. Not that that's P funk inspired. Okay. okay. But it's not a P funk film. I, I, I have yet to make my P funk film. Okay. But P funk inspired me. I, I talk about some of my work in terms of music. A lot of my work in terms of music, and it's still here to, for me. It's like really, I was explicitly thinking about Miles Davis when I made that film, and, and saying if Miles was a filmmaker, what was his aesthetics? look like in filmmaking as opposed to sound like in jazz. Like, and so I just tried to transpose them over to another medium. Um, and, um, and I kind of call Reckless Eyeballing kind of a blues film in a way. Mm. Um, but, you know, I have yet, yeah, I, you know. But, you know, like I said, this is uh, speaking in tongues take one, that's why. It could be other takes. Chris, could you mention why you use the voice of Betty Davis? Why I use Betty Davis? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, he's talking, he's talking about uh, the voiceover in the film, both of the voices. Where I, just, I wanted to get voice actors, and all my attempts fell through, so I ended up using AI voices for the film. <laughs> and so I cloned Betty Davis. Um, the singer Betty Davis, who at one point was um, um, the spouse of Miles Davis, I, I just I was looking around for. I said, I need a, like a funky voice, you know. And I found an interview with her, and I cloned her voice. And I, I used it because of the grain that she has a kind of um, scratchiness in her voice that's really subtle that I like. And, uh, but it weirdly ended up sounding. Somehow, it's, it's, it's a bit uncanny and unsettling for me to listen to that voice because I keep calling that voice her and it's not a person. <laughs> but, and, and the, Joe can tell you, in the 29 hour <laughs> editing marathon, I said her over and over and over. But that's because when I cloned Betty Davis's voice and it went into this, the AI software, it came out sounding eerily and remarkably like a dear deceased friend. So it's like, and who also did the voice of monologue is still here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little unsettling. I, I, I think in this showing, I started to get over it for the first time, but sitting with it all the time, I just kept thinking, saying she and her, and I had to keep catching myself because it's, uh, it's a program, it's an algorithm. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think 
The next screening where people can see, still hear, and speak in tongues is going to be April 8th okay. at Red Cab with Chanel Brown. So all of you folks, I hope to see you there. That should be a really good screening. And I guess we might see a different, maybe. Well, no, not by then. Okay. okay. Need a <laughs> no new take. No new take. Uh, no not takes. for the right. time being. That, that yeah. makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for all being right. here with us. Thank you to Adam and Tim Brown. Thank you all. And thank you all for being here. Have a good night.